is the 17th meeting of the Justice Committee and our first hybrid committee meeting. Can I start uh, by welcoming all the people in the committee room today and all of our virtual participants who are John Finney, Liam MacArthur and Fulton McGregor. We have apologies from Margaret Mitchell and Alistair Allen who can't be with us today and we're joined by Morris Corey and Bill Kidd as their substitutes. Before we begin, can I remind any members, witnesses and staff present that social distancing measures are in place in committee rooms and across the Holyrood campus. I ask that all take care to observe these measures over the course of this morning's business, including when entering and exiting the committee room. Can I also remind members not to touch the microphones or consoles during this meeting? As usual, members should indicate to me if they wish to ask a question and the sound engineer will activate your microphone. Can I invite members to agree to take item four at today's meeting in private? Agreed. Agreed, thank you. Our next item of business is an update on the impact of COVID-19 on our justice sector and policing. Can I refer members to papers one and two? And I welcome our first panel of witnesses, Eric McQueen, Chief Executive, Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service, and Theresa Medhurst, Interim Chief Executive of the Scottish Prison Service. Can I thank the witnesses for any written submissions uh, that you've made, and I invite them to make some short opening remarks, and then we'll move um, to questions. We have one hour for, up, uh, for this panel. So, can I invite you to make some opening remarks? Mr. Okay, I'll, I'll go first if you wish. Um, good morning, committee, and thank you very much for in inviting me along here this morning. Um, I just want to say, just really very briefly, I mean, since I was last at the committee meeting, all our courts and tribunals have now opened or reopened across Scotland, um, and that took place on the, the 2nd of June, and then progressively as we, as we moved into June. Um, it's fair to say that took a tremendous amount of effort. Um, I think we were the first national body to bring staff back in and reopen our buildings and making sure that we put the, the protection of court users and their safety um, very paramount in, in, in our first priority. Um, I think it's also fair to say that you know, throughout lockdown, a third of our courts were open dealing with the essential and critical business. And I'd just like to, to pay tribute to our staff, to judiciary, to the legal profession, the prosecutors and the third sector for all the efforts, both during lockdown and the, and the period thereafter. Quite clearly, the aftermath of lockdown and the ongoing impact on social distancing um, will impact enormously on the justice system. Um, the backlogs across the court system, particularly in criminal, are significant, and those will take a, a number of years to deal with, and they will need radical solutions to find different ways of dealing in a, a new socially distanced environment. And I think we're very cognizant that behind these numbers are people. Um, victims, witnesses, accused, whose lives essentially have been put on hold and we need to find creative and innovative ways to try to get the justice system re-established and reduce some of these time delays. Some of the work we, we have done has been mainly in, in the civil area where we've moved largely now to a virtual or remote environment um, across all parts of civil business and tribunal business, importantly freeing up capacity within the criminal courts. In criminal courts, we've introduced remote hearings, we've piloted virtual trials, we've now restarted the full programme of, of summary trials, and on Friday we announced the, the very radical approach of looking to create remote jury centres to make sure we can get the most serious trials um, up and running in a, a short space of time. Um, throughout the next couple of years, this is going to need significant effort to deal with the backlog um, and ongoing investment from government, which we have been speaking about on a daily basis. But most importantly, it's going to be really key that we work very collaboratively with all organisations in the justice system. Um, I think if we look back, there'll be things over the last four or five months that we haven't got right, um, things that we could have done better, and I think we've got to be honest about that. Um, I think the work with Lady Dorian's working group looking at solemn trials is an excellent example of what people can achieve when everyone comes together with a single focus. Um, and that's certainly the approach that we want to take over the, the coming months and into next year as we start dealing with the, the backlogs and bringing the, the justice system back into action. Thank you. Ms Medhurst. Thank you very much, convener. Um, again, I would like to echo the, the comments that Eric made about having the opportunity and welcome it to meet with the committee today. Um, and to answer any questions you have on the way in which um, the Scottish Prison Service has responded to the challenges the COVID-19 pandemic has presented um, thus far. There is no doubt that the pandemic um, has placed significant demands on our organisation and will continue to do so for many months to come. 
Um, I would therefore like to put on record my thanks to staff at all levels and with all parts, uh, within all parts of the organisation for their hard work, flexibility, professionalism and commitment to the SPS during this time. I would also like to record my appreciation and thanks to all of our NHS colleagues who have continued to work alongside us, strengthening our partnership working and providing support to those in our care throughout um, our prisons. I know for anyone working through this period, they have had to manage the, both the challenges um, of working in a changing environment with changing conditions, as well as dealing with the impact of the restrictions on their personal lives. And this has not always been easy. However, my thanks are also due to those in our care, their families and their loved ones for responding with such a high level of cooperation to the restrictions we have had to impose. Those in our care have donated to food banks, they have made fa uh, face masks for health and social care workers and have complied with the restrictions we have had to introduce to minimise the health risks with limited access to families for support during this time. Families have also had to endure months of restricted access to loved ones in custody. This has been particularly hard on children, and I am acutely aware of how difficult this has been, so I am grateful for the understanding which has been shown by so many. Without that cooperation and understanding, our task would have been so much more difficult. We have also benefited from significant support from partner organisations in both public and third sector in shaping our policies and guidance in response to the pandemic and ensuring this has been informed by user voice and changes in practice in communities. In the course of the outbreak thus far, we have unfortunately had a total of five people in our care who have sadly um, passed away where COVID has been a factor in their deaths and a total of 31 prisoners who have tested positive. We also have had 62 staff who have tested positive with the virus and at the peak of the um, shielding provisions we had around 678 staff who had to self-isolate. At the point of lockdown it is fair to say however that we had feared that the impact of the pan pandemic would be much worse um, but um, finally what I would say is that, uh, that we have um, appreciated and give thanks to colleagues in government and to the Cabinet Secretary for their unstinting support and assistance. In managing this situation and seeking to mitigate some of its most challenging effects, we have always found support and understanding. So I am very proud of all those who live and work in our prisons who have responded magnificently to the challenges thus far. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, we now move to questions. And can I start with Maurice Corey? Please. Thank you, convener. Um, good morning, uh, Mr. McQueen and Ms. Medhurst. Um, good to see you here. And can I just first of all say well done uh, on getting this service back to, to normality or starting it on the 2nd of June? And would you give our good wishes to your staff and everybody involved? I think it's an excellent effort through what's really a very difficult time. And obviously, people are anxious to get things moving. Can I talk about the, um, the sort of case backlog and the sort of prioritization of it? Um, and in particular, the latest sort of backlog figures for criminal courts uh, and civil courts and tribunals. Can, can you give me some idea of what's happening there and what the figures are? Yeah, I'm very happy to go, go through them. And I think, I think that's quite an important place to start. Um, if we look at criminal, first of all, and we, we, we look at the solemn business in the High Court, um, prior to lockdown, we had about 390 cases awaiting trial. Um, that's not a backlog, that's just a normal number in terms of the queue waiting on trials coming through. Um, as of the end of August, we anticipate that will be about 750. Um, and depending on the models we put in place, that had the potential to increase to some 13 or 1400 over the next two or three years. Um, with the announcement on Friday of moving to the, the, the jury centres, um, we expect in a short space of time, probably by about October time, to start to move back to our normal capacity of about 16 trial courts up and running across the High Court. Um, with that in basis, what, we, what would happen over the next number of years is that the number of outstanding trials would probably plateau about 800. Um, so it would still be double the normal level, um, but it would plateau and not increase beyond the 800. Our discussions with the government at the moment is how we can increase that capacity further. Um, so could we move from 16 trial courts potentially to, say, 25 trial courts? 
Um, if we were able to do that, we could reduce the backlogs on the High Court and bring it back to their normal levels within two years. So we are discussing some quite <coughs> radical options about how we continue to increase capacity and we continue to get additional trials running to reduce that backlog. So I say as we stand at the moment, the backlog over the next couple of years would probably be about twice the normal level. If we can create additional capacity to run even further High Court trials, we could pull that down to normal levels within probably about a two-year period. In terms of jury business within the Sheriff Court, prior to lockdown, there were 500 cases awaiting mm -hmm. trial. Mm -hmm. um, we reckon by the end of August that will be about 1,800. And if we carried on a social, social distancing mode, that would increase to quite well over 2,000. Um, again, if we bring in the remote jury model, and that's what we're discussing with government at the moment, um, we anticipate that we can slowly start to eat into that backlog, but it would take something around about five or six years to bring it back down to the pre-COVID levels. So again, we are looking at ways we can increase the capacity further um, to run more than the normal level of solemn trials. And if we can get that operating on the level of investment, it could potentially bring the trials back down to the, the pre-COVID levels again within a two-year period. So for both the High Court and the Sheriff Court jury, there are options if we can create the right environment and have the right funding to find means where we could bring the trial backlogs mm -hmm. back down to the normal level within about a two-year period. Um, so I think that paints a picture of just quite how dramatic the impact of both lockdown and, and social distancing has been on, on the High Court, and that, that's quite significant. Um, just looking very briefly at the, the Sheriff Court, um, prior to lockdown there was 14,000 cases outstanding. Um, as of the end of August, that will be 27,000. Um, we now have our full programme of courts back up and running as of August. Um, that's running about 33 trial courts a day. And what we would see is a gradual reduction in that backlog of about 2,000 a year. But just simply running 33 trial courts a day would take us a period of eight or 10 years to come back to the, the pre-COVID levels. So again, what we are discussing with government is additional investment to increase the capacity by about 25%. Um, putting an extra 10 trial courts up and running, and that could reduce the backlogs within about a three-year period. Mm -hmm. The other option which we will look at, I think, as we get into next year, is the potential to run courts over the weekend, mm -hmm. um, as to whether we run trial courts on a Saturday. If we brought that in, that could reduce us back down to the business as usual levels for two years. All of these things have impacts not just on the court, um, but on prosecutors, on defence, and on mm -hmm. third sector organisations. Mm -hmm. And as you can imagine, there'll need to be quite significant discussions over the next short number of weeks and months to find out the best solution and the optimum solution um, that meets the needs and the resources that are available to, to all the organisations. Um, we've got a similar position on just the Peace Courts, where the, the backlog pre-COVID was 3,500 cases. Um, it's now currently sitting at 8,000. We reckon that will come back to a business usual probably within four years, and again, with additional investment, <coughs> we could achieve it within about a two-year period. So, you know, two years is really looking at the, the most optimistic level to bring cases back to pre-COVID levels, and potentially longer if we can't mm -hmm. get that capacity, or if the investment across the entire justice system is not available. So on, on the criminal side, it is quite dramatic mm -hmm. um, in terms of the, the impact both from lockdown, but also the ongoing impact of, of social distancing. And clearly that's one of the factors where it's, it's difficult to get predictions of how long that will be with us mm -hmm. um, and, and to what extent will be, will be hampered to a certain extent by social distancing. On the, the civil side and, and, and tribunal side, the picture is, is a lot more positive. Um, on the court session, um, the, the Superior Civil Court um, it is operating as an entirely virtual court, um, and it has been now for probably the best part of two months. Um, there are no backlogs in the, the court of session, um, but quite clearly some of the proofs are taking slightly longer to allocate and deal with, but that will be worked out over the course of about the next year. Um, in terms of comparisons, just to give you an idea, case registrations in the first quarter um, were 81% compared with the first quarter last year, and comparing July this year with July last year, the case registrations are now up to 102%, which I think just reflects the progress they've made in dealing with any backlogs. 
and proof levels in the court of session are now about 70 per cent of what they were at this time last year. So, by and large, the court of session is working now very effectively. Um, there are very few backlogs. There are just some additional delays in terms of having proofs allocated, but that will work its way through during the, the course of the next year. In the Sheriff Courts, it's a very similar position. All our national courts, the All Scotland Personal Injury Court, the Sheriff Appeal Court, um, the Bail Appeal Court are all now working in an entirely virtual um, mode, and they have again been doing that now for the, for the last two months. Um, the business levels in the, the Sheriff Courts are, are, are down quite significantly. Um, they were down to about 21% during the first quarter compared to previous years, and that's increased about 50% on July comparison with previous years. I think part of that reason is that there has been a halt put on quite rightly um, in terms of any eviction cases or mortgage arrears cases, which take up about 30% of the business. And I think also what we are seeing the effect of is quite a number of solicitors and administrative staff who are still currently furloughed and, and, and yet to return to work. So our expectation is that the, the business levels of the share of courts will gradually increase over the next two or three months. And given the fact that we can deal with the, the business remotely and, um, and, and virtually, again, very much like the court session, um, we think that will work itself out over the, the next six or 12 months. Mm -hmm. so the, the, the issue on the civil side is much less um, dramatic as it is in, in, in terms of criminal business. Um, just to finish off on tribunals, the, the major or at least the, the largest tribunal in terms of volumes is the Mental Health Tribunal. Um, it deals with about 5,000 applications a year. Um, since lockdown, there's been over 1,900 statute hearings that have taken place. Um, all my telephone, there's no, no, none have been cancelled and they are up to date with, with no backlogs. Um, the only tribunal with backlogs at the moment is the Housing and Property Chamber, um, where they have backlogs of about 800 hearings. Um, all of those hearings have now been allocated remotely and will take place over the next two or three months. The vast majority of other tribunals are pretty much up to date, their volumes are very low. Um, but they are putting in place virtual and remote hearings to deal with the business. So, yes, there are pressures on the civil and tribunal, um, but in sorry the, the, the civil and tribunals areas. But in comparison to the, um, the criminal area, it, it's a much more manageable position, and one which we think will resolve itself, as I say, probably over about a six or twelve month period. Can I just have a follow-on question, Kavina? Uh, very good to hear all that information, and, and quite clearly, if you. If you, if you draw a line under it. Um, we're looking at basically double the workload to what you had pre-COVID in, in general terms. I in, in general terms for the yeah. backlogs. And Can, you, you make lots of um, points about where you're going to be and hope to be and everything else. Um, what assumptions have you used to base your estimates? Because that's very important. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you, you refer to investment, I know, is one of them. But yeah. Putting that aside, are there any other assumptions you've made? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the assumptions that we're trying to make is, is, is about the impact of social distance. And now, to a certain extent, the remote jury centres does take some of that away. Um, but quite clearly, in terms of the summary criminal business, that's, that will be an ongoing impact. So our, our assumption is that social distancing will be in place until at least March next year. Um, and some of the detailed documents were produced, we've got other projections which show social distancing being in place potentially to March 22, what that impact would be. Um, we are so, you, so you've taken it on further than that to 22 as well? Sorry? Social distancing on to 22 as well. If you? it goes on to 22, then, then potentially some of those backlogs would increase. And I say some of the, the detailed reports that we shared with the committee mm -hmm. on Friday um, actually put that out in some significant detail. Mm -hmm. um, we've made assumptions around about the, the maximum capacity we can start to make available. And you know, part of this is very much from the starting point. We recognise our capacity will be reduced by a third. Um, but I say what we have done is try to move as much business as possible into a virtual environment to make sure that the physical hearing capacity is maximised to its, to its best extent. So across not only civil but also in criminal, mm. we have a whole range of remote hearings taking place now for the procedural aspects, again, to take people out of the court building to make sure that the capacity can be dedicated to trials. Um, the other thing which we which we've factored into our model is, is what we call the conversion rate to trials. Um, quite clearly, not all of these cases will end up in an evidence-led trial. So in the High Court, for example, about 62% of cases traditionally will end up in a High Court trial. And that's been quite consistent over the last four or five years. There, as a risk that as the trial becomes further away, then there's less likelihood potentially of cases settling earlier. Because why would someone plead if the trial is not going to be for two or three or four years' time? 
And also there's quite a significant issue about witnesses in terms of their either availability or willingness to give evidence for trials that could be some way away. So again, within the detailed modelling reports, we've put in some variables round about that in terms of what the, what the impact could be. Mm -hmm. So these are the types of things we've tried to bring into your modelling to give people a, as full a picture as we can and, and a trampa, transparent picture yeah. as to what the different options could be. Can I just ask one final question, please, on this? Remand, you, you have made no mention of remand and people on remand, and therefore it's quite a serious consideration. Yeah. Where is that in your priority list and also in your assumptions? Yeah, in terms of the, 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 the priorities, I mean, people on remand and in custody are, are always a priority. And, and during the, the lockdown period, um, custody trials were prioritised, and, and there were, I think, about 48 custody trials took place during that critical lockdown period. So people on remand and the length of time they've been in remand will always form part of the priority in terms of trials come forward, as will cases that involve children or children witnesses or particularly vulnerable adults. So there's a, there are a range of things that are taken into consideration, um, but clearly people on remand is, is one of the key factors, um, and, and that's always part of the... Um, Keep the key prioritisation decisions. Thank you, Convener. Thank you. Can I bring in Liam Kerr, please? Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Eric. Good um, morning. I, I'd just like to follow up on a couple of questions that Mr Corrie's asked. Um, so, first of all, you, you talked about that conversion rate, uh, which, which I was very interested in, um, because it seems to me that uh, the assumptions underlying that are quite key. Uh, so it, it, some of the figures that I looked at, the, the Sheriff Court solemn trials, the estimated number of cases by March 26 is expected to be 1,188 if the physical distance is in place till March 21. But if the conversion rate increases to 56% from 36%, the number of cases will be 6,900 uh, by 2026. Um, now that's, I, I find that fascinating. Um, so can you just give us a bit more about what that what those figures are based on and what the likelihood of that conversion rate uh, you talked about the witness availability you talked about the, the pleading so what does your modeling suggest the likelihood of the 56 percent over 36 percent might be um, I, I think the likelihood rate will depend on, on what model we adopt um, so at the moment we are in discussion with government about creating the remote jury centers for the sheriff and jury business um, if that is the case, we expect to have those in place by the end of this year, um, probably November, December time. If that is the case, that will give a much greater certainty in terms of cases proceeding and, and, and trials will run through quite quickly. I think if we, if we get that in place, the risk factor of the conversion rate increasing will drop quite significantly. So as long as the jury centres come in place, we think the risk of that will be relatively low. If the jury centres didn't come in place and we couldn't run those 18 trial courts a day and we had to reduce a, a, a vastly lower number, then the risk of the conversion rate increasing it probably becomes more of a reality um, because the longer people see the, the judgment day being more into the future, then I say the more likelihood is there for people not to plead early and there is risk that witnesses will no longer want to participate in a trial if it's going to be a number of years down the road. So if we were sitting here today saying that we didn't have a solution and we weren't confident we could deliver remote jury centres, I, I would be more concerned. Um, I think if we can deliver the jury centres by the end of this year, I think that will reduce the risk quite significantly and will be closer to the figures that I'm, I'm projecting today. But it is a risk that we play with. I understand. Um, just very briefly, if I may, on, on the remote jury centres, um, there's a letter from the Cabinet Secretary on the 14th of August, which refers to five and a half million uh, coming your way for the, the High Court remote yep. jury centres, but presumably there are other uh, needs for remote uh, sheriff and, and jury processes. Is, is there any money or is there any discussion taking place about the money that you need for to run that as well? Um, there, there certainly is, and that's a, an ongoing discussion we're having on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. um, so the five and a half million will put the capacity in to create the two remote jury centres for the High Court. Um, to create the same model for Sheriff and Jury Court will be something in the region of about six and a half million pounds. Um, so that's an, an ongoing active discussion um, and hopefully in a, a relatively short number of days or weeks we'll be able to confirm and make an announcement on that. Excellent. Um, final thing for me, just on uh, Maurice Corrie brought up about prioritisation mm. of, of cases. Now, obviously that's uh, a, a current and immediate reaction that's, that's understandable. Um, <clears throat> but how do you anticipate that changing? How do you anticipate the next year, let's say, looking in terms of prioritisation, uh, 
in order to get the backlog down? Um, I, I don't think the prioritisation will change that much. I mean, so the, the basic principle of prioritising is, is cases where people are in custody. Um, prioritising cases that involve children or vulnerable witnesses is actually prioritisation that existed prior to COVID. Um, so actually, we don't see that radically changing, to be quite honest. Um, I think there's three areas of custodies, children witnesses and vulnerable adults or vulnerable children um, will always be the priorities. Very grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can we move now to John Finney, please, who is joining us remotely? Thank you very much indeed, convener. Uh, good morning, panel. Um, I have some questions for uh, Mr McQueen. Um, much of it has been covered, but I wonder, Mr McQueen, if I can pick up on your last point about the prioritisation, and that, uh, where you talked about vulnerable witnesses. Can I ask, please, about the status of the Glasgow Evidence and Hearing Suite, which, to my mind, would be fundamental in uh, not only supporting uh, victim survivors, but also perhaps addressing capacity issues um, when it comes to actual the trials, C can you talk about the position of that suite, please? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the the Glasgow Evidence Suite was our groundbreaking suite that we created um, during the course of last year for very much the um, the, the purpose that Mr. Finney points out, um, really to make sure we've got somewhere where people can give evidence directly to courts, but very importantly, where we can take evidence on commission in the more serious cases with pre-recording of evidence being done well in advance of the trial. Um, the, the suite was designed to be very discreet, to be very personalised and to have a very different feeling from a court environment. Um, unfortunately, it wasn't designed to deal with two metre social distancing. Um, so at the moment, the vast majority of the suite we are unable to use um, because of some of the issues with social distancing. Now, there is work currently ongoing at the moment in terms of how we can adapt that, and we do believe that we can get at least two of the re rooms back into use at quite an early stage to use for vulnerable witnesses. Um, meantime, we have been making wider use of the court estate where we're not running court business at the moment. Um, so there have been 40 evidence by commission hearings already taking place and there are another 48 scheduled. So we, we, we absolutely are given the preference to vulnerable witnesses and we're just trying to work very carefully with our state and our specialist facilities at the moment to how we can we can maximise that capacity while we work within the challenges of, of two metre social distancing. Um, thank you for that. Thank you for that, Mr. McQueen. Um, I mean, could I encourage every uh, step to accelerate the, uh, the adaptation? Because, of course, this is the, the direction of travel many of us would want to, to see in respect of how we. Uh, uh, absolutely. It's, it's, survivors. it's a priority for us, and, and if we can maximise some use of those facilities, um, th then absolutely that's what we'll do. Um, thank you very much indeed. D just a, a couple of um, questions, uh, briefly, if I may. You've covered a lot of ground, but um, the experience, you, you touched on uh, Lady Dorian's uh, group, and uh, you've also alluded earlier to, to some of the work there. Could you maybe just say the, the experience of running the, the small uh, jury trials over the summer, what uh, lessons have been learned from that, please? Yeah, so, so we run two, um, two different models of jury trials over the summer, one in Glasgow, using a three-court model where the the jury was dispersed within the public areas of the courtroom, and one in Edinburgh where the jury was in a, a completely separate room, but they were a video linked in. Um, both trials, both different models have, have worked fairly well. Um, so the feedback from all involved is that they were perfectly satisfactory. Um, I think the, 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 the clear consensus that came out was the idea of having the jury remote from the trial court was actually a better model. Um, I think it was... The jury were seen more as a collective group together, whereas where there was space around the public galleries, it was quite difficult getting the viewing angles, and it was quite difficult for both defence and prosecution to engage directly with the jury. Um, in the two-court model in Edinburgh, what we created was what we call a jury wall, where actually directly above the jury box um, are large screens, as Mr Finney appears on the screen today, showing each of the individual 15 jury members. So when the defence and the judge or prosecution were addressing the jury, essentially they were addressing the jury wall and, and looking directly at the jurors. Um, the jurors in the remote accommodation um, had a very good view through different cameras and screens of views of the judge, of the accused, of counsel, of defence, um, to give them a, a full view as though actually they were sitting within the jury room. 
So that came out as the, the queer preference, and that's what really led us to the idea of looking, well, if we can have the jury remote from the, the trial courtroom, can we have it remote from the building altogether? Um, and that's what led us to look at the cinema model as being a, a purpose design model with good space accommodation, excellent um, technical infrastructure, and very large screens, which can be subdivided. Um, so the jurors sitting within the, the jury centre now will look at the large screen in front, and that will be divided into four. So there'll be a, a view of the judge, the view of the accused, a view of, of, of counsel and prosecution, and in the bottom hand of the screen, any video evidence that's displayed in court comes directly back to the jurors. So they, the two trials were, were, were very key to actually making sure we found the right solution. Um, and I say certainly working very collaboratively with prosecution, with defence and with the third sector, I think has come up with a solution um, that, that everybody's very comfortable with and feels it's the, the right direction now to take. Uh, thank you very much for these replies and indeed for all the work you and your staff are doing. It's appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Maurice Corrie. <coughs> In your question, and following on from the point that Mr Finney has just brought about the remote participation in court cases, uh, will this not lead to a lessening of the local justice um, in, in the process of this and possibly to more court closures? Um, I would hope that the answer to both of those is no. Um, I think what we, what we actually found out quite interesting with the, um, some of the virtual courts and remote access is that what we do provide is audio connection where it's appropriate to do so, mm -hmm. um, so that anyone can dial in and either hear or in some cases actually view it. Mm -hmm. And what we have found with some of the, the cases that have quite a high public interest is we've actually had many hundreds of people actually tuning in to view the court proceedings in, in a way that we just never have happened before. So, so maybe there's something here that is actually a way of winding access to justice. Um, in terms of the locality, I think it's very important that local justice is always delivered locally. We went through a, an extensive programme some five or six years ago where, yes, indeed, we did close a number of courts without Scotland. Mm -hmm. I think at that time we were very clear we thought this was the right long-term model and it was a long-term model that would be incumbent on heavy investment in terms of technology, increased remote proceedings and trying to, to minimise physical attendance where possible. So actually what we've achieved over the last four or five months is entirely consistent what we set out as being um, the, mm -hmm. the path of direction we see. So local courts will always play their part irrespective of, mm -hmm. of what model they go down um, and any concerns over access to justice or closure of local courts is not something that's even on our, our radar to be quite honest. Um, Convener, can I just ask a follow up from that? Very yeah, very, very quickly. Um, so what sort of uh, exemplar are you using or comparator are you using to see that that is not happening, that, that it's actually working, the remote participation? Have you got something to sort of base it on? Um, the, 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 against, sorry, base it against. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 there's various academic studies that have been done that are of interest. Um, they've all been quite long, um, fairly small scale in terms of their stretch, to be quite honest. Um, one of the things that we are thinking about putting in particularly and in, in doing this very much for the remote jury exercise is putting in quite a comprehensive evaluation. Um, so we are talking to um, Scottish Government just analyticals, but we are actually also thinking about engaging some academics to carry out some sort of longer term study of some of the benefits and some of the pros, because this will be something that will evolve in time and I know that it will change over time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, what we're putting in today might not be the perfect model and two years' time or three years' time, so we've got to be very open that we're, we're willing to change and willing to adapt. Yeah. Thank you. Um, before I bring in Shona Robson, I just wonder if I could ask you um, quickly what work um, has been done to ensure that people with learning difficulties or communication difficulties are assisted you know, when it comes to um, participating remotely? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think that's a really good question, and I think actually it's something we've got more work to do. Um, so trying to assess the needs of individuals coming to any court proceedings has always been a key part of the process. Um, so the preliminary hearings before um, trials or before cases come to proof is always very much about looking at the needs of the individuals that are coming forward. I think as we move more and more into remote hearings, then, then, then actually that's something we need to be better at. Um, so I think we've got to find a better way of signposting the support um, and being very clear and understanding about the needs of the individuals that come forward. Mm -hmm. The vast majority of remote hearings at the moment have involved, tended to involve more the legal profession, so it's been more people's representatives. Um, but there has come quite good academic evidence round about um, access to, um, or, or people with learning difficulties, um, how they access different ways. Now, in some days, it can actually improve the access. 
Um, so I think you're right to raise it. It's an area where I think we've got more work to do, um, but it is something that does form part of the initial consideration. Okay. So no remote hearing takes place unless there's agreement with all the parties in terms of how the remote is going to operate and, and what facilities might be available. So that, that check's already in place, but I think there's more we could probably do um, in advance to actually signpost to make clear what services are on offer and how they can be adapted. Okay, thank you. Um, Shona. Uh, good morning. Uh, can I just uh, ask you to outline the, the measures uh, currently in place to prevent the transmission of, of COVID-19 within court buildings and whether you've had any feedback on how well those measures are, are working and ways in which they might be improved? Yeah, I mean, we carried out some quite comprehensive risk assessments, which we, we, we published um, five or six weeks ago on our, our website at the time setting out what our risk assessment approach was to the reopening of our buildings and safety. Um, we took extensive advice from Public Health Scotland and we liaised with other jurisdictions in terms of the, the models and systems they can put in place. Um, so that risk assessment is out there and, and is published. Um, we've made a, a significant investment in terms of a deep cleaning of our court buildings. Um, we've got a vastly increased cleaning regime that takes place on a, a daily basis with instant access to deep cleaning when we need it. Um, we've got extensive signage over all of our buildings. We've got floor space markers indicating two metres social distance. And, and we've marked off quite extensively areas where you know, seats that can't be used or areas that can't be occupied. So we've tried to go very much for the, the high visibility. Um, we've tried to communicate that very clearly on our website. And we've got information leaflets that are available for court users and, ju and jurors trying to spell out and describe the types of circumstances. Um, the feedback so far, I think, has been very positive to that. Um, fortunately, we've had no outbreaks within any of our court buildings, and in touch with that's a good place mm. to be, but we know for the grace of God that could, that could quite easily change. Um, but we also have very clear procedures in place that if anyone does display symptoms, then exactly how we deal with that individual, how we get them into an isolated area, and how we then treat the area that they've been involved in. Um, so these are things that we're quite live on, and we work with both the the Crown Office and the Law Society and produce some joint guidance, which is again on the website, um, signing up to the commitment we have in place. I think where we, where we are at the moment is that I think what we've got in place is, is adequate and it's performing the good. Um, I think there is a real risk about complacency. Um, I think we've saw that amongst our own staff. I've probably experienced it myself. Um, we've seen it with judges and we've seen it with, with people that use our court buildings, that perhaps there was a, maybe a risk even up to a few days ago that people were actually maybe getting a bit too complacent um, and actually it was quite hard to, to remember. Um, so we have gone at great length to reinforce this with our staff. Um, I have written to the Crown Agent and the President of the Law Society to ask them to just restate the position with the staff to make sure that people do stick to it. So I don't think it's the, the, the measures are weak. It's just that I think there is just a natural complacency. Um, I think a lot of the stuff that's been in the media about the lockdown in Aberdeen and different areas, I think are making people very aware that the virus is out there. Um, it's not gone away. Um, and making sure we stick to the rules and stick to the facts that are put out by government is the absolute key thing. Um, one area which we are considering um, is about the compulsory wearing of face masks. At the moment, we, um, people can wear face masks within the public building, um, but it's not mandatory at the moment. Um, I think as we start to bring more business back into the courts, um, I think it's a fairly logical position that we'll probably move to quite quickly, um, where we will in insist and encourage until we can get a legislative basis that face masks are worn within all the public areas um, of our buildings. When do you think you'll make a decision on, on that? Um, it's something we're discussing actively at the moment, right. and we're just having some discussion with Public Health Scotland um, about some of the issues, but I, I expect it's something we'll move on mm -hmm. um, in a short number of weeks, if not quicker. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McQueen. That was very helpful. We're going to move on now to some questions about the Scottish Prison Service, and I'll ask James Kelly. Um, Okay, thank you, convener. Good morning, panel, and good to be back physically at the committee meeting in, in Holyrood. Um, question to Ms Medhurst. It's in relation to the prison population. At the start of the pandemic, the prison numbers were at 8,200, which is fairly high, puts pressure on the estate, and the committee has previously raised concerns about overcrowding. Uh, obviously, with the prisoner release scheme, that brought the numbers down to 6,900, but we're now starting to see them rise again. Uh, we're now at 7,300. So what's your view of the trends going forward? Are we going to see a return 
to the levels we had at the, the outset of the pandemic, which are obviously a, a, a concern around overcrowding. Thank you very much. Um, I, I think the way that you've described um, the position with regards to the population um, is very accurate. Clearly, we were sitting at that time, I think, with probably just over 70% uh, single occupancy um, levels um, because of the, the population um, increase um, over the period of the, the winter time. And because of the, the slowdown in court business and also um, the early release arrangements, that did bring us below 7,000. And at that point, we were sitting, um, I think, at the maximum around 85% single cell occupancy. There are some difficulties with some of our um, multiple um, uh, populations um, with regards to those who are potentially sex offenders or um, protection prisoners and some of those tensions mean that, that it makes it more difficult for some aspects of our prisons to uh, reduce to single cell occupancy totally. Um, with regards, I mean there are some establishments where we don't have those problems but where we have most difficulty are our um, local establishments such as Berlin, Perth, Edinburgh. Um, and with the recent increase in population, that's where we've seen the double occupancy levels rise again. So clearly during the um, height of the pandemic and the height of the restrictions, the increase in single cell occupancy allowed us to apply the, um, the uh, protective measures that we required to put in place in line with government guidance and with Health Protection Scotland guidance in a way that ensured that um, we have managed to keep the number of cases in prisons to a low level during that period. But as we are starting to come out of lockdown and lift the restrictions in prisons in line with um, the government's route map, clearly the risks increase and as we move um, to greater occupancy in terms of a rise in the prison population, then clearly there are health concerns um, around that, as well as concerns regarding the amount of activities that will be made available to those in custody due to the, the restrictions in physical distancing. Okay, um, thank you for that. Just in terms of the, you, you referred to the restrictions there and the Heard League for, for Penal Reform and others have ex just expressed concern around the, the mental health and the well-being of prisoners, uh, particularly around restrictions on exercise, education and showering. So what is the plan for lifting those restrictions as we move out of lockdown? So um, we, as you know, had to make some amendments to the prison rules and we made decisions at the very start of the lockdown restrictions based on what we at that point anticipated may, may require some flexibility around. Our experience has been that um, those restrictions, um, particularly surrounding access to showers, um, access to, to food and um, clean clothing and laundry have not been required. So whilst um, the current amendments run out at the end of September, we are anticipating um, laying further amendments um, to give us a degree of flexibility because we have faced um, some pressures around, uh, currently there is a, an incident in uh, Low Moss Prison where we had a member of staff who tested positive and there are currently over 50 staff who are isolating us per government guide guidelines and 124 um, prisoners who are restricted in terms of access to um, movement from out with their area. They are still getting access to fresh air and they are still getting access to recreation, um, but we haven't recommenced the access to education on that site as yet until we're through this current period. So the issues that, that communities are experiencing with regards to spikes and outbreaks, um, clearly we anticipate being a feature of prisons as well. And therefore, there may be some requirement to continue with some of those amendments to the rules. However, we won't be taking forward those that we haven't used um, and, don't, and don't see that we would need to use going forward. Okay, finally, can I ask about uh, home detention curfew? Mm -hmm. um, 
the, the, the numbers being released under home detention curfew are still at a, a relatively low level. Um, obviously, they, they had decreased uh, around the time that there was a, a conviction for murder relating to a prisoner released on home detention curfew. Uh, what's your view on the, 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 those numbers? Are they likely to, to increase? Thank you for the question. Um, I think the, the position with the HDC, as you rightly say, changed in, in 2018 and, and some of the regulations around um, access to HDC changed quite considerably at that time. Um, since the uh, pandemic, so there were around um, 40 roughly um, on HDC at that time, there have been two further changes that have been made to HDC. One is the removal of the pres presumption against release in the HDC guidance um, with regards to decision making. And the second um, is extending the eligibility criteria to include those individuals at a medium supervision level. Since we've done that, the figures have increased slowly, um, but clearly the early release arrangements did have an impact on that because a number of those individuals would have been eligible for HDC applications. So there are currently anywhere between 80 and 90 um, out on HDC. There is further work that we're doing um, with government around that. We're doing some internal workshops um, this week and we are reinstating our um, learning sets for managers who are involved in HDC applications so that we've, one, got a better understanding of um, if there are particular issues uh, that we need to improve in terms of our processes, then we can um, move on that quite quickly, but also to understand whether or not we are achieving the maximum benefit from the HDC scheme in the current uh, configuration. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, can I bring in Liam MacArthur, please, who's joining us remotely? Hey, thank you, convener, and uh, good morning, uh, panel. Uh, can I start, like others have, uh, by thanking you and your colleagues for your efforts uh, over the recent months during uh, an enormously challenging period? Uh, Morris Corey earlier referred to the problem specifically in relation to the remand population in our prisons. Obviously, uh, the pandemic has exacerbated uh, this problem, but it was uh, an issue, a serious issue, uh, leading up to uh, March as well. I think the figures uh, we have were um, the remand population was around about uh, 1,400 over 2019-20, uh, rising now to just under 1,700. It's an issue I raised with the Cabinet Secretary in the Chamber uh, but um, these levels are in quarter of our prison population, about twice the number south of the border, really do appear to be at unsustainable levels. So what is it that we should be doing to try and bring down um, that, uh, that overall number uh, and proportion of our prison population who are there on remand? Thank you for your question. I, th I think um, we have seen an increase, obviously, in, in the remand population. I think since the beginning of May, um, that remand numbers have increased by over 800. Now, clearly, there's a significant impact um, by the restrictions that have been placed on court business. And as court business starts to reopen um, and returns to w whatever normal business that looks like, then um, there will be a, an impact on, on remands. And it's, it's unclear, I think, at this stage um, as to what that's likely to be, particularly if you consider that there will be uh, those who will have spent an extended period of time on remand and how much of that sheriffs will take into account at a point that they um, apply sentencing. So I think it's, it's really difficult at this stage to understand what the, the further implications will be for the remand population going forward. But certainly th I know that there have been um, discussions in, in government um, and through um, other justice forum um, to look at um, how best that can be tackled going forward and to consider what other options can be put in place in order uh, to uh, tackle some of the, the real pressures around remand um, at the present time. Um, that's helpful. I thank Ms Meadows for that response. However, um, Ms McQueen was talking about a situation in terms of how we get back to a kind of manageable um, backlog within the, the court system, but it seems in relation to remand that not only should we be 
unwinding the numbers, the additional numbers that we've seen uh, coming into the prison system on remand, but actually improving on the, the situation uh, pre-pandemic. So are there any specific issues the Cabinet Secretary uh, mentioned, electronic monitoring of those on bail that we should be considering? And in particular, given the, uh, um, the, the higher rate of remand for uh, our younger prison population, the numbers might be quite small, but as a percentage of the overall um, uh, prison population amongst young people, the rate is significantly higher, I understand, uh, uh, for young people. Are there specific steps we can be taking and to address that aspect of this issue. Um, I, th I mean, you, you're, you're quite right. Cabinet Secretary did, did mention the electronic monitoring linked to bail, um, and um, so that that is one aspect that clearly will offer um, another alternative to um, placing people um, in in court on um, on remand. Um, with regards to, to other options, I certainly think that um, there have been other options that have been scoped, particularly um, through the work of um, Community Justice Scotland, um, who have um, been doing some work around community alternatives and what that um, may offer um, in order to provide court with more options around remand. I think the other thing is uh, that we, we know and understand that a proportion of those who come into custody certainly have um, a number of um, related issues around um, housing, around addictions issues. Um, and so a number of those factors may well be impacted on where um, electronic monitoring, for example, to be introduced as part of a, a bail option going forward and certainly give more scope for those who come into custody, uh, to prevent those coming into custody that we currently see coming through our doors. I mean, uh, thank you very much for that uh, response. I, I just maybe conclude with a, an appeal for um, maybe some more re written detail on those measures. And again, as I say, uh, specifically in relation to any measures uh, aimed at reducing the uh, the rate of remand uh, amongst the young uh, prison population. But thanks very much, convener. Thank you. Um, can I just, on, on the back of that question, ask if you happen to have approximate figures of the number of women on remand at the moment? I'm sorry, convener, I don't have that's, that. That's fine. No, I just threw that at you, but maybe you could you we'll know, forward that. That, that would be helpful. Absolutely, send that on to you. Thank you very yes. much. Thanks. Um, can I bring in Shona Robson, please? Okay, um, thank you. Just uh, a few questions regarding uh, conditions for, for prisoners and family contact. You touched on this briefly earlier on, but with the easing of uh, lockdown restrictions, um, what has been the position in terms of uh, uh, prisoners getting more time out of cells and purposeful activity and so on. Has that um, improved? And also, if you could say a little bit about families um, getting obviously able to visit prisoners again since early August, um, with some exceptions for obvious reasons. Uh, compared to the pre-lockdown situation, what are the main differences for visitors in terms of numbers and times, etc.? Thank you. Um, I'll start off with the, um, the restrictions. So <clears throat> we have in place arrangements whereby um, we put in a, a new governance structure, which includes um, not only operational people, health colleagues, um, health and safety representation, and trade union side partners, um, but it also includes health protection um, Scotland and local health protection colleagues across each of the establishments to ensure that all of our plans and phase plans comply with um, have, uh, robust risk assessments. We are working in partnership with our trade unions, um, are informed where we can by user voice, and also um, include the latest and most up-to-date health guidance, because clearly health guidance has been changing, particularly for us. We are deemed or termed as a complex setting um, and so a number of changes have been made to the guidance, um, particularly in the early days, but, but more recently as well, and particularly in relation to lifting of restrictions. So we, we have taken at each stage um, of the lifting of restrictions in the community, we have taken um, a commensurate approach within prisons, 
and try to reflect the experience and the um, not only the experience but also the facilities that we have and lift restrictions at the same time and in the same way. We have not been able to do that exactly as timorously as government has been able to do because clearly prisons are much more complex in terms of um, both the staff and resource that has been available to us as well as there are different conditions on different sites, different prisons are, have different physical environments. So we have, for example, the, the lifting of um, the lifting of uh, the restrictions around um, no access to visits um, took place, was phased over the course of a week, and that was to allow establishments to ensure that they had in place um, the most effective um, approach that they deemed appropriate in order to protect people's safety, and that was informed by the best health guidance at that time. So in terms of lifting restrictions, we have followed the, the government guidance and we have increased those social bubbles that we created at the very start of the pandemic around the number of people who could associate together both um, at exercise and at recreation in order to facilitate greater time out of cell. We have, um, throughout the pandemic, kept some of our work parties um, going because we needed, obviously, to give people meals and we needed to, to do laundry and cleaning. Um, but we are now um, in line with government advice um, going back to uh, re-establish those work parties that can now be put in place. And as of the 11th of August, we also reinstated learning. So the learning centres are now operating as well, but on limited capacity, as I'm, I'm sure you'll understand. Um, with regards to, to visitors, um, again, we understood um, that there would be um, quite a lot of anxiety around coming back into prisons again, both um, for families, particularly for children. Um, so what we wanted to do was ensure that the experience was um, as positive as it could be. So we used um, families outside who are a third sector organisation and our visitor centre providers to do some um, consultation with families to understand where there may be some um, tensions or issues or what their concerns may be in order to be able to provide a, as positive an experience as possible. What that has meant is that um, all prisons except uh, Berlini have restarted um, visits again, allowing three visitors in. Berlini only allows two at the moment because of the size and the numbers. Um, in addition to that, when people come in, they must wear face masks, but not in the visit room. Children under 12 obviously can have um, physical access. Um, and um, we have restricted the numbers within visit rooms to ensure that there is physical distancing takes place during the visit. So far, um, we, we put all of the advice and guidance up on our website to ensure people understood what the experience would feel like when they came in. Um, and so far, the um, feedback that we've had has been, been positive. Th thanks for that. It, obviously, um, virtual visits have probably become more of a, a tool um, to enable families to keep in touch. Is that something that's going to continue um, beyond the pandemic, particularly given the distance that some families have to, to travel? Is that something that you see being um, as important going forward? The virtual visits has been a, a revelation, if I'm being quite mm. honest. Um, you know, hearing stories about um, you know young children being able to show um, dad that they've got new shoes for school um, because they wouldn't have been able to do that coming up to a visit previously. Um, I think it's been quite, quite painful for some people being able to see into their homes that they've not been in for some time. But it's also opened up that remote access, as you said, so foreign nationals have been able to, to utilise the service. People um, in islands in particular who can take days and at significant cost to come down for visits now have much more frequent access. So that is certainly something that we see as being a hugely positive benefit um, and that we would hope to continue past the pan pandemic. Um, could you give us a, a very brief um, update on the, the level of through care available to prisoners and you know what the impact has been on provision of that service? Just briefly. So... Uh, that's a really good question because I think that's probably an area where we probably we're focusing so much on internal processes we forgot about people 
who were, were leaving prison and how much the, the environment would have changed for them. Um, and particularly, it was brought home with the early release arrangements. So we moved very quickly to work um, with um, public sector and third sector partners to look at ways in which that we could better prepare people for both the changes in services in communities, because a lot of the services moved to telephone or online access, which was going to be problematic for people, but also to better understand how they would need to comply with the, the current um, restrictions within society, what that would look and feel like for them, um, and ensure that they were connected into services. So that meant things like our health colleagues providing those who required prescriptions with seven days medication and a prescription for 28 days. Um, and we improved our data sharing ar arrangements as well with our public sector uh, providers um, or partners to ensure that we could better connect in and make preparations for people who were leaving custody. So all of those things, I think, made a difference to people when, when they were leaving, but clearly they are moved into a world that has changed quite considerably. Okay, if you have any further detail on that, it would be useful no, to, to provide uh, the committee with that. And just finally, um, you touched on um, LUMOS earlier. Um, are you able to tell us today how many prisoners and members of staff are currently self-isolating? You mentioned LUMOS, but what about the entire estate? What are the... So, in terms of the entire estate at the moment, there are 134 individuals um, who are isolating. 124 of those are those low MOS cases, um, 10 across um, eight other prisons, um, and we haven't had a positive case in prison for something in the region of over 90 days. Um, so, these are, are precautionary at the moment. But clearly, whenever, whenever anyone in prison identifies or is deemed to have uh, symptoms that could be um, COVID-19, then they are tested uh, immediately by our NHS colleagues. That, that's very good news about no positive case for over 90 days. Uh, and just finally, um, you know, what action has been taken when there have been failures to comply with social distancing, obviously, which is part of your management of, of COVID within the, the estate? Um, I mean, obviously, there was, um, you know, we, we heard um, uh, an issue re regarding uh, HMP Kilmarnock, where I think the inspectorate found that staff at times didn't adhere to the rule that should wear PPE um, where they can't maintain the two metre distance. So could you just briefly tell us what, what action has been taken in so, so all through the pandemic we have, have put out regular almost weekly messaging around social distancing, compliance, personal responsibility. Um, and our guidance has been very clear and open to people and where people can't um, apply physical distancing, then they require to do their own um, assessment and um, wear appropriate PPE. But equally, we have guidance on where PPE must be worn, particularly when they are dealing with people who are isolating because they are symptomatic. Um, what has happened recently, which um, we are um, we have taken steps to do, is we were aware, as Eric alluded to, that public health guidance, particularly around complex settings, was likely to change, um, and that face masks may become mandatory. So we took the decision ourselves a week past on Friday to uh, make it mandatory for everyone to wear face masks. Updated guidance went out on Friday of last week, um, giving more specific and detailed guidance as to when and where. So if you're sitting in an office on your own, clearly you don't need to wear a face mask. However, if you are in a public area, if you're leaving your office and you're moving around a public area within the prison, then you are required to wear a face mask. So we made that change as we um, considered that it was likely to be the case. However, it doesn't negate people's personal responsibilities and the messaging that they still requires to go out around ensuring that people apply physical distancing when, when and where they can. Um, so we would continue to encourage people to do that, encourage people to come forward when they haven't done so. Um, and clearly, if there are any instances where we feel that there has potentially been any negligence, then we would need to take more firmer action. 
So the face masks apply to staff, but they wouldn't apply to prisoners in communal areas? Not, not, not at the moment. Not at the moment, but that might be something that, that, that would is, be considered? That, that will continue to be under active right. consideration as we move further out of the restrictions. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Our final question is from Liam Kerr, and if I could ask you maybe just to keep questions and answers brief, please, because we're slightly overrunning. I certainly shall, convene. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, question for both of you, if I might. Um, just very simply, what impact is the pandemic having on your spending plans? Uh, what conversations are there about next year's budget, and uh, are you looking for increases, and if so, where? Okay. I'll go first. Um, I think it's probably yes to all of those questions. Uh, to be quite honest, yes, we are having extensive discussions with uh, the Scottish Government at the moment. Um, we have got a subgroup formed of the Justice Board and just named it the Criminal Justice Board. So this is bringing together the main criminal justice organisations to try to look quite collectively at the range of solutions that we're considering over the next few years and, and what the overall impact is going to be. So to make sure we're coming up in a a joined up position, not just each organisation looking at their own their own particular priorities. So that's work that's ongoing at the moment and that's actually reaching quite a, a good stage and that'll be part of the, the key planning for next year. Um, clearly from our perspective there is significant ongoing investment that will be required for the, um, the remote jury centre, so we've already talked about the size of money that's involved in that. Um, this year we've already received £4 million from government to upgrade our digital infrastructure and put in place the, the facilities we need for remote hearings. Again, there will be a continued need for that as we go into future years. So, yes, discussions are very active and, to be honest, it's very large numbers that are coming out of some of those discussions, as you probably will not be surprised. Thanks, Eric. Just to reflect what Eric has said, yes, there, there are cost pressures um, and obviously some of it is around digital, some of it is around um, PPE. Um, and we are very closely monitoring those cost pressures. We are reporting them into government. We are in conversation with them. We did get an uplift in our budget this year, um, but clearly in terms of planning and preparation, we are um, looking to next year as well. So um, all of that, I think, is very, very complex at the moment because it's really difficult to see, particularly because of the lockdown restrictions, the impact that that will have going forward. Um, so we are monitoring the budget closely and will continue to work uh, closely with government colleagues around expectations, but um, they are well aware of our cost pressures at the present time. Thank you. Um, that brings us to the end of our questions. And can I thank both witnesses for that very helpful information that you provided. And um, I suspend for five minutes to allow for a change of witnesses.
Welcome back, everyone. Um, our second panel today is the Cabinet Secretary for Justice and his officials, Neil Rennick, Director of Justice, and Claire Hicks, Deputy Director, Police Division. Now, welcome the Cabinet Secretary and his officials to the meeting and invite the Cabinet Secretary to make some short opening remarks before we move to questions. Good morning, uh, convener. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me to provide the committee with an update on the continuing impact of COVID-19 on the justice sector and what can be expected over the coming months. It's, it's really important to update uh, and engage with committee on how Scotland's justice system has responded thus far to the challenges presented by COVID-19, but also to set out what we're doing as a government to allow the system to recover, to renew, and I welcome that engagement today and obviously going forward. Um, let me start by expressing my sincere thanks to everyone who's working in the justice sector. I'm sure members will join me in paying tribute to the dedication, to the ongoing commitment, to the resilience, to the adaptability of all justice agencies and those on the front line for their support and response during this public health crisis. I would again like to put on record my appreciation and gratitude to our police officers, to police staff, for the excellent job that they have done and continue to do during the public health emergency. Their approach has commanded rightly widespread support and been firmly within our traditions of policing by consent. I'm sure members will join me in paying tribute to them, to them and the role that they have played in supporting the regulations and guidance and keeping us all safe. The effective action taken by prison and health staff has helped, has helped to keep the infection rates in our prisons low. Uh, this has been acknowledged by others, including, for example, uh, Her Majesty's Chief Inspector of Prisons for Scotland, who has noted that decisive action taken uh, has been, and I quote directly, no mean feat given the vulnerability and close confinement of those in prisons. The level of stability that has been maintained uh, during this time, <clears throat> excuse me, is testament to the efforts of those who work and live in our prisons, and my sincere thanks remain to them. Because of the low infection rates, SPS is now able to implement a phased approach to easing restrictions, including the return of in-person visits in all prisons and recovery of all key parts of the regime. We know the virus hasn't gone away and it won't feel normal just yet for visitors as physical distancing and strict hygiene measures are in place. Uh, but I know this will, be well, this will be a welcome relief for those who have deeply missed seeing their loved ones in person. The use of virtual visits across the estate and mobile phones, which are now in place in the vast majority of our prisons, will continue to be, in, continue to be used in conjunction with in-person visits as SPS continues towards regime recovery. As part of that recovery process, SPS is actively considering the need to extend, amend or revoke the various changes made to the prison rules in response to the pandemic, uh, taking into account the need to ensure it's prepared for all eventualities including, of course, any resurgence of the virus, either nationally or locally. Any such changes will, of course, be subject to parliamentary scrutiny in due course. The decline in prison population numbers due to the decline in court business and the effects of the early release scheme was very much welcome and contributed to SBS's ability to success successfully manage the spread of COVID-19. Uh, the early release process was not something that was decided upon lightly, but it was effective in helping our prison service respond to covid and protecting the health of prison officers and indeed those in our care. We'll continue to be vigilant, we'll continue to work with SPS and indeed our justice partners to consider whether more needs to be done to maintain the safe and effective operation of our prisons. We continue to monitor the population closely uh, over the coming weeks and months. We will consider what further action will be required to both reduce the use of imprisonment, but also to maintain a lower prison population. Uh, uh, convener, last week I wrote to the committee to provide a clear assessment of the scale of the challenge facing our justice system in these uncertain times. The, this demonstrates the need for imaginative joint working to reduce delays and mitigate their impacts as much as possible. And we're already making progress. And when it comes to our courts, uh, we have new digital approaches supported by emergency legis legislation. They've been introduced. Uh, we also have remote hearings that have been rolled out uh, across the courts. Uh, sheriff courts across Scotland have reopened with priority being given to custody cases and last month high court trials restarted in Edinburgh and Glasgow in new formats designed to ensure a safe and secure process which accords with public health requirements. I've recently agreed funding to the court service to take forward 
a ground groundbreaking and innovative new solution, uh, a new approach that will use cinema complexes as remote jury centres to make up to 16 jury rooms available for high court trials. I want to acknowledge the adaptability, the resilience and hard work of everyone across the wider justice system and third sector that has worked so hard to bring about these changes and serve the people throughout the pandemic. Uh, however, I also recognise that further work will be required to address the very serious situation we face. These are challenges being faced by jurisdictions right across the world, and there's no easy answers. Addressing a case backlog is much more than just a statistical exercise. Court delays have a huge human impact and significant implications across the entire justice system. That's why it's so important that we work together to recover, to renew and transform the system as a whole. As always, uh, convener, uh, Deputy Convener, I look forward to answering your questions, recognising that operational matters, obviously, for the Scottish Tribunal and Court Service, rightly rest uh, with the Lord President. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. We will we'll move to questions. Can I start by um, saying it, it would appear that Police Scotland's approach to policing during the pandemic has been very positive and that public engagement has been positive. Are you satisfied that Police Scotland continues to use its emergency COVID-19 powers proportionately and with the public's consent? The short answer is yes. I, I'm very confident of that. Uh, you'll have seen a range of surveys that have been conducted um, uh, looking at the levels of confidence the public have in Police Scotland, uh, and they have been exceptionally high. I think the Chief Constable has taken, uh, and his officers have taken, a common sense approach. We know that enforcement has been the last resort, so they've often looked to, to, to engage, to, to explain, to encourage, uh, and then at the, as a last resort, enforce uh, the law where necessary. But of course, where necessary, they have enforced, and you can see that from the number of uh, fines and fixed penalty notices um, that have been um, that have been handed out to people. So I, I've got a great degree in confidence um, in the approach Police Scotland have taken, and in particular, I would have to commend the Chief Constable for uh, tremendous foresight in setting up the uh, uh, review group headed by John Scott and, and a number of expert stakeholders who are looking uh, at the approach Police Scotland have taken to policing during the pandemic. Uh, and advising police accordingly. Thank you. Um, move to questions. First one, um, Maurice Corey, please. Thank you, Gavina. Um, good morning, Cabinet Secretary and, and, and panel. Um, can I also add on to, my, uh, to your comments about the police and prison service um, work they've been doing during this very difficult time? And I think it's been tremendous, and I congratulate them on it on both services uh, and thank them for their positive approach to it as well, which is excellent in both cases. Um, Cabinet Secretary, the, has the, co the Chief Constable raised any concerns with you at all about the speed at which we're moving through the government's route map at the moment? It's a really good question uh, from, from, from the member. So Chief Constable and I, or you know, his, his DCC team uh, and I, will talk uh, on very regular occasion uh, up, until, uh, up until this point, you know, it'll be twice a week. Um, so we'll speak very regularly, but what's important is, you know, Claire Hicks and, 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 and her team will engage with Police Scotland, uh, as I will, regularly in advance of changes that we look to make, be it in, in relation to the route map or indeed having to respond to certain circumstances. So, for example, the cluster that we see uh, in, in, in Aberdeen. And um, we, we, where appropriate, we'll take feedback from Police Scotland. So, you know, when it came to the opening of outdoor hospitality, for example, mm -hmm. you know, Police Scotland uh, rightly uh, said to us, like, we'll, you'll want to avoid the situation uh, that, that took place in England, where, where, where uh, my understanding was the, the, the outdoor hospitality opened on a Saturday. They suggested, like, opening beer gardens uh, on, on a Saturday it wouldn't be a wise move. Uh, and, of course, I then fed that back, and, and that's why we opened uh, beer gardens uh, during the week as opposed to on, 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 on a weekend. So I'll often take the feedback of the Chief Constable uh, Police Scotland. I, I don't think there's been any kind of major concerns raised in terms of the pace at which we've been moving uh, throughout the route map. And, 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 you know, you've seen the Chief Constable attend the daily briefings on a number of occasions alongside the First Minister to show that joined up approach that we have. Um, but certainly the advice and the feedback that I get from Police Scotland uh, for me has been, been, been absolutely invaluable. Mm -hmm. How do you feel that the Chief Counsel has been reassured that the, the government's plan is going, going according to plan? Is he, how do you reassure him on that? Yeah, I mean, obviously you need to ask the Chief Constable whether he feels uh, uh, reassured uh, or not by, by, by what the government uh, says to him. But uh, certainly for the conversations that I have 
it's really important that we include Police Scotland right at the beginning uh, mm -hmm. of when we are formulating ideas, uh, not just formulating ideas, but actually working our way through uh, the route map, for example. I think there would be a big, big difference if we were to make a decision without involving the police and then the police having to, to, to catch up with the guidance, the regulations, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas actually, because we have such a close relationship with them, um, uh, you know, nothing catches them by surprise. Uh, they're working with us. Uh, and, 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 and therefore they're able to prepare their officers um, for, for what announcements we're going to make. Uh, and, and that's an arrangement that works well for both of us. Thank you, Mr. Convener. Thank you. Bill Kidd, please. Thank you, Convener. Um, Cabinet Secretary, um, you've, you've mentioned some of this already, actually, but um, I think it bears, um, bears speaking about it again. Um, the fact that Police Scotland's approach has very welcomely uh, been to engage with the public before thinking of moving to any enforcement action. Um, are you aware of any changes, as you mentioned, clusters of infection, um, any changes which are going to um, have to be seen with maybe raising the enforcement uh, level? I uh, know you, you, you've talked about John Scott's review group um, and how I'm working with the Chief Constable and the Government. Um, as we move through the route map, are there any difficulties in maintaining the engagement approach rather than enforcement actions? Yeah. Look, I think they're both really good questions. Um, from, from a kind of Police Scotland um, perspective, you know, policing by consent is so, so important at any given time, but I think particularly during this pandemic, because what we're seeing is the biggest restriction of people's liberty, um, certainly that I've ever seen in my lifetime. Um, uh, for good reason, of course, for public health reasons, but certainly the biggest restriction of people's liberty. And therefore, if Police Scotland took the opposite approach that they're taking at the moment and went in with enforcement first, there's no doubt that uh, I think certainly that that would have uh, really damaged um, their their important relationship that they have with the public. So I think the 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 the, the kind of four E's approach that they've taken, um, and, and and the fact that enforcement has been the last resort is absolutely the right uh, uh, approach to, to to have taken. And in answer to your question around, you know, where we may see clusters or outbreaks, and therefore. Does there need to be a change in approach? I think what's helpful about having the single national police force is what we've seen in Aberdeen is that Police Scotland are able to draw on resources very quickly uh, and bring those up to Aberdeen in a flexible uh, manner. So they had you know, a flexible force, additional resource coming to Aberdeen uh, at the time when, when, when Aberdeen, uh, some of the restrictions in Aberdeen were reimposed uh, a few weeks ago now, um, or a couple of weeks ago now. So uh, that, that that's really... Uh, incredibly important that Police Scotland are, are, are able to do that. I suppose the last thing I would say is where Police Scotland have to demonstrate, um, you know, have to, have to use an, an approach um, where, 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 where they have to, they feel they, they, they have to enforce. That's one, an operational matter, of course. But secondly, uh, you know, they, they, they will do so where they feel that's appropriate. And I suppose the, the example I could give would be um, you know the very infamous case of volleyball and goalie. You know for for you know utterly reckless uh, action that, um, that, that 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 he took. Um, he was issued as as you know in police Scotland have made clear with a fixed penalty notice, um, and they thought there was a number of aggravating factors, number of reasons why they took that approach. But I thought remarkably important that they took that approach because of the message that it sends out to people uh, and because of the high profile that footballers uh, and, and their status as role models in society. So, um, you know, where necessary, they'll take an enforcement approach. Um, and, and I'm very confident, as I say, in that approach they've taken thus far. For that, um, now, can I just follow on? Because I think um, my following question is very relevant from what you've just said there, Cabinet Secretary. Um, very much the police, as we've been saying, have been engaging with the public rather than moving to enforcement action. But recent indicative figures have published by Police Scotland show that about 3,000 fixed penalty notices have been issued in relation specifically to COVID-19 legislation. Um, however, um, during this good number of months now, uh, other offences will obviously take place, um, which we're not really um, generally covering um, in the media or anything, and 
Um, in relation to these other offences during this period, the committee would be interested to know if there have been a significant increase in other offences other than the type of offences that are related to COVID. As, as, um, has the population's um, behaviour patterns changed very much during that period in other ways? So certainly uh, we saw um, in the beginning of the pandemic, so when we were in, 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 in lockdown, uh, that undoubtedly had, a, had an impact on, on crime. There was less crime uh, being, being committed at that time. Um, and we saw that in jurisdictions uh, right across the, the, the United Kingdom for, I think, very obvious uh, reasons. Um, but there was, also, there was always concern about, about other types of crime potentially increasing during that time as well. So domestic abuse, again, being, being, being perhaps the obvious um, one to mention. Uh, so so uh, we can certainly look at the, 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 the most recent data that we might have on that and happy to write to the convener. Uh, on that. In terms of fixed penalty notices, he's right to say that Police Scotland are publishing regularly fixed penalty notices and other uh, engagements that they've had with the public in around the coronavirus legislation. Uh, in terms of other offences, uh, we would not have the figures for lockdown. I'd write and say we'd have kind of figures for quarter three, 2019-20, but we wouldn't have figures uh, for for a lockdown period, but if the member will allow me, I'll, I'll go back to Police Scotland and, and officials, and if we do have any update on that that we can give, that's verified, verifiable statistical data, then I'll write to the convener, who will obviously distribute that to committee members. That's great. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Thank, thank, you, thank you. Can I bring in Liam MacArthur, please, who's joining us remotely? <laughs> Uh, thank you, uh, Convener. Good morning, good afternoon, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Um, I, during discussions I've had with the Chief Constable um, earlier on in, in lockdown, I think it's fair to say that um, they were perhaps pleasantly surprised by the, the level of compliance um, with the lockdown uh, restrictions. Obviously, as restrictions start to be eased, the, the messages become a bit more uh, nuanced, a bit more complex. And as we've seen, there are outbreaks that um, uh, that occur in different parts of the country. Aberdeen, the most notable ones, but there's been a, a localised one here in, in Orkney, and uh, there are others in other parts of the country. I, what sort of specific challenges does that um, provide for policing, both for the communication and the messages the public, but also for the the way in which um, advice and guidance is uh, enforced at a local level, that may be um, different uh, from uh, what is applying uh, at a national level. Well, can I, can I thank Lee MacArthur for, for for the question? I think it does present challenges. Uh, of course, uh, a national message that applies in a blanket way right across the country is, is is much easier to communicate than a more nuanced message tailored for particular regions or geographies. Um, but uh, what I would say from my regular discussions with Police Scotland is they are uh, pleased with what they would regard as the high level of uh, compliance in, in, in Aberdeen, for example, from uh, licensed premises. Um, they, 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 they've been really pleased with uh, the uh, response uh, from hospitality uh, and others in relation to the reimposed restrictions. Um, in, in, in Aberdeen. Um, so I think we have to accept that where there are regional outbreaks and, for example, again in Aberdeen, if there are restrictions that are reimposed, that there's always going to be a challenge around messaging. So we have to ensure that the government, Police Scotland, local council and all the other stakeholders are speaking with one message um, and, and being very firm in our messaging and around Aberdeen, and again, if I took the Aberdeen example, I thought that was done very well. Uh, even by local MSPs uh, here, you know, I think we, we saw from local MSPs that represent the North East region uh, and, 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 and indeed uh, Aberdeen itself, for those that were right across the political spectrum, um, they, they, they all communicated the same message that it was with a very heavy heart, um, that, but they understood that these restrictions had to be reimposed. I think that's exceptionally helpful uh, when we're able to do that. Um, and I think it's helpful also just having the Chief Constable again um, often uh, alongside the First Minister as he has been at the daily briefings because the number of people that are watching that uh, receiving those messages I think are, um, are, are is really, really positive. So, um, yeah, challenging 
Um, but it's clearly the Aberdeen example shows that uh, that messaging can be effective. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. The local MSPs for the North East and for Aberdeen um, have, a, I think you're absolutely right, been consistent in their message. They've also, um, I think, been critical um, that certain businesses uh, do not appear to be uh, adhering to the uh, to the advice and to the, the restrictions um, and urging uh, more of a, an interventionist uh, approach there. Given the resources available to Police Scotland, um, how would you see um, the, the task of, of prioritising where those resources are, are applied in terms of uh, enforcing the restrictions and, and in particular, a, a concern that has been raised with me in the past at a, at a local level is some of the the, the grouping together of, on the one hand, restaurants and cafes um, with uh, pubs and bars under a, a general hospitality banner, when the businesses themselves operate very differently, and the, and the way in which um, social distancing, etc., can be uh, applied and enforced in those um, different businesses, probably uh, very different. So, I, what, what from your com conversations with Police Scotland are, are you looking for in terms of a, a proportionate and a common sense uh, targeting of the uh, of the action um, and the deployment of the resources available? Yeah, so I suppose a couple of points or a few points to make. One would be, and I know that Liam MacArthur is certainly not suggesting this, but 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 we don't live in in in, in a police state where we would expect the police to be knocking the door of every single uh, establishment uh, in Scotland, out, you know, hospitality establishment, to ensure that they are uh, obeying the rules. What they have done uh, is, for example, often before uh, the uh, uh, before indoor hospitality reopened, uh, many police officers engaged with their local contacts uh, on their on their beat, uh, went in, into those premises, made sure they were ready uh, for reopening and understood the rules around reopening uh, of hospitality. And I think that was a very sensible and welcome move. But all of the onus on this can't be put on Police Scotland. And rightly isn't on Police Scotland. Um, local authorities have a role to play. Uh, environmental health have a role to play. Uh, and so many other stakeholders uh, have a role to play. But ultimately, of course, the responsibility should be on the individual premises itself to make sure it's adhering to the rules. And there are consequences, of course, for it not adhering um, to, 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 to those rules. In terms of the kind of resource question, I, I just go back to the point I made to, to Bill Kidd that, 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 that there is a flexibility within the National Service whereby resources can be redeployed uh, if additional resources are required at, at very, very quick uh, notice and, and, and pace. Um, but, but, but I take his, his, his general point, I think, um, you know, there's, there's always going to be a challenge with localised outbreaks um, particularly if we begin to see more and more of them, and um, particularly if we begin to see restrictions being reimposed in in, in, a, in a number of areas or regions, um, you know that will put an, that will put a resource implication on Police Scotland, and and that's not something I would uh, deny. But I would like to see other stakeholders also making sure that they are playing their part uh, in, in in any role that they have in this. That's very helpful, and I think the clarification in relation to the responsibility that Police Scotland have, um, uh, alongside the other um, agencies referred to, is, is an important one to make. I, I think, just finally, um, would you accept that um, while we've seen localised lockdowns, which have uh, been difficult for the, the, the communities affected, uh, but have perhaps spared um, the, 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 the wider problems created by um, a, a national uh, relocking down of, 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 the, uh, of the country. At the same time, there may be individual sectors where problems um, are, are persistent. And is it um, his view that the Scottish Government will be looking at the way that um, easing of, res um, of restrictions as they apply to specific sectors? Um, may need to be uh, revisited if there are uh, continued problems with, with compliance going forward. For sure. That has to be part of the conversation. Uh, the First Minister has made no apologies for saying that uh, education will be prioritised. Uh, if that means that we have to close down pubs and bars in order to protect uh, uh, education, uh, then, then, then we would look to do that. Um, so absolutely, we want to open up society uh, in a way that is absolutely safe, 
to do so in accordance with the public health advice and guidance that we receive. But at the same time, uh, if we have to reimpose uh, certain restrictions, then we would have to look to do that, not just on a, on a regional basis, but also potentially a sectoral basis. I think we've made no, no bones about that. Um, but we've taken, as a government, uh, I think a very right, uh, correct, uh, cautious approach. Uh, and that's the approach that we continue to take. But uh, I accept the point that Liam MacArthur makes. Can we move on, please, to John Finney, joining us remotely? Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, convener, and um, good afternoon, Cabinet Secretary and your panel. Um, Secretary, can I, I start by agreeing with you on the outstanding work of our public services? And, and when you make uh, a mention of the huge human, human impact, I think that's at the forefront of all our minds. I have some questions around the case backlog and jury trials of May. Uh, you sent correspondence to us on Friday. Are you content that the short-term and long-term measures that you sent out will reduce the backlog? And when realistically will we see the backlog return to previous levels or even be reduced from those? You know, I wish I could give you a more definitive answer than I'm about to give you, but this is a, a problem that is facing uh, jurisdictions right across um, the United Kingdom, but also right across the globe. Uh, you can't have uh, jury trials and, and, and court business effectively suspended for uh, the period that we have had over the last number of months and not expect quite a significant impact. Uh, and so we have seen that, and, and, and obviously I heard you were taking evidence from Eric McQueen, and I, I caught uh, certainly the tail end of that uh, evidence, and he would have articulated uh, undoubtedly very well the challenge of that backlog. What my... Uh, job is to do is to make sure that we are exploring every possible solution, or potential solution, in order for us to address that backlog. And it's why we've funded uh, the external remote jury centres uh, and cinema complexes. Um, you know, it's a really unique idea. I know uh, the court service in, in, in England and Wales are also interested at in looking at what we're doing up here. Uh, in Scotland, um, and that's just one example I can give you of where we've looked at very innovative approaches, never tried before, never done before, outside of the pandemic, wouldn't have even given it a moment's thought. Um, but uh, we will look at those innovative solutions to try to um, do what we can to mitigate the backlog from getting any worse. And then, of course, making a dent into that backlog. There is no panacea, there's no silver bullet, there's not one solution. Uh, that will magic this problem away. Uh, even even if we did have a pot of money, which you know we don't, everybody's in a challenging financial circumstance. Um, so I'd align myself with what Eric McQueen said at the committee uh, previously about the extent of the backlog, the scale of the challenge, uh, and just reiterate what I've said around the human impact of that. And I've spoken to a number of organisations and indeed uh, victims themselves in the coming, uh, sorry, in the last few months. Uh, and, and, and there's no doubt that whether you're a victim uh, or the accused or a witness, um, this is having a significant impact. I'll maybe pass over to Neil Rennick, uh, who's here also, uh, and he may be on to add uh, to what I've said. Yeah, just to confirm that, um, just as the Cabinet Secretary said, that we're, we're confident that um, with the additional funding that's provi been provided for the, the jury centres, that that will allow initially the High Court and then uh, Sheriff and Jury cases to return to um, having the capacity they had pre-COVID. As the Cabinet Secretary said, what that won't do is begin the task of eating into the backlog that's built up, and we're doing further work to look at um, the, the best way of doing that. But I can confirm that we're, we're confident that there is significant cross-justice activity looking at this and identifying the solutions, um, including the innovative option of the, the jury centres. Thank you, Mr. Lennock and Cabinet Secretary, for that. If I can just put, push on, on a, a specific, please, and that's the the announcement Friday about the non-court venues and the more remote juries in the backlog. The, the news release states it will be possible to run a much higher number of trials. How much higher, please? So we'd have capacity for 16 uh, juries, uh, high, high, high court jury rooms to be available. Um, that would be the same capacity that we had pre-COVID. So as I looked to, to, to Neil to get confirmation, that would be the same 
uh, as we had pre-COVID. So what that would mean is that in terms of high court jury trials, that should help prevent the backlog getting any bigger. What it won't do is make a significant dent into the backlog that we had pre-COVID. So that's where we'd have to look at what other solutions we could possibly bring to the table. But certainly the the, the 5.5 million funding for the cinema complexes will allow us to run or have the capacity to run as many trials as we had pre-COVID. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Briefly on the other venues issue, I don't know if you heard the question I posed to um, Mr McQueen about the Glasgow Evidence and Hearing Suite um, and the innovation that that type of location brings. Um, it's not operating capacity. It would make perhaps a, small, a modest dis difference in terms of numbers, but a significant difference in terms of the well-being of uh, victim survivors. Will you push to ensure that that is open to as much capacity as it is safe to do at the earliest opportunity, please? Yeah, I, I didn't hear Mr Finney's question uh, previously. I think it was still in Cabinet at the time. But, um, you know, one of the operational matters, of course, for Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service, but everybody recognises the state of the art uh, facility that that is. I, I think I'll be right in saying Justice Committee may be visited uh, at one point as well. So uh, you will have seen for yourself uh, how good the facilities are there. Uh, I think it's a real shame uh, that they're not able to be used to the full extent or capacity. Um, but I completely understand the restrictions on that because of public health guidance. And it is very much in line with public health guidance uh, that the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service uh, are receiving. But we're certainly in very close contact with the uh, SCTS about that facility uh, and indeed uh, any other facilities that can be reopened for taking, for example, evidence by commission. Um, so there's no, it's not a lack of desire from anybody, it is just simply uh, within public health guidance. But again, I, I don't know if Neil Rennick wishes to come in on, on that specific point. Uh, again, just to confirm what the Cabinet Secretary said, we're working very closely with the, the, the court service and they're speaking with victims' organisations, looking at a range of options that might allow uh, victims to provide evidence remotely or have their evidence taken uh, by, by pre-record. So uh, yeah, we're, we're very keen to see the, the facility in Glasgow operational. We are looking at other options and other facilities that might um, uh, allow victims to, to uh, provide their evidence remotely. Thank you. And, and very briefly, if I may convene, I'll just uh, again on the news release about the non-court venues, um, Lady Dorian's working group concluded, and I quote here, using remote juries minimise the need to change the fundamentals of the trials process itself, uh, which would be time-consuming and have uncertain outcomes. Um, the Cabinet Secretary's letter um, uh, to the committee said Lady Dorian's group believes that, quote, this option need not be pursued. Um, Cabinet Secretary, does that now mean that you too are ruling out the need for smaller juries? I just, uh, you know, I'm reluctant in the midst of a global pandemic uh, to, to, to be so firm as to say we'd never look at smaller juries, but certainly at the moment, um, you know, with the solution that we have, um, uh, there's not a need to pursue that option. Uh, at the moment, um, so so it's not an option that we're actively exploring, actively looking at, or, or, or actively pursuing, because the solution that we have in place allows a 15-person jury socially distanced. There's plenty of room in the cinema screens uh, for that, so so it wouldn't make um, sense to to exert uh, effort to explore that option at the moment. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. We still have a number of questions to get through. We're aiming for a 12.30 finish, so I'd appreciate short um, questions and answers, please. Liam Kerr. Very briefly, convener. Uh, just on that exact point that John Finney raised, um, uh, your letter of 14th of August to your Cabinet Secretary, uh, where you talk about the smaller number of jurors, but you also talk about adjusting the sentencing powers of sheriff courts. Now, there's been a lot of modelling done recently, uh, which is to the good. Uh, have you also modelled the impact of adjusted sentencing powers for sheriff courts? And given all that modelling, are there any other short or longer term options that will require legislative change that you're now considering? So the only other option that we're looking at for legislative change is the exact option that Liam Kerr uh, mentions in, in relation to adjusting, thing, adjusting the sentencing power uh, of, of, of sheriffs. I mean, the key to this will be to what extent we extend uh, the powers. Uh, clearly, the, the, the further we extend those sentencing powers, then the, the, the more scope there is to bring uh, business into, in, in, into the sheriff courts. 
Um, in, in terms of forecasting, forgive me, I don't have that uh, to, to hand, and I'm happy to provide anything that we may have in, 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 in the interest of transparency. Um, but I'm not convinced uh, that it would make a hugely significant impact because I think the expectation of the legal community and indeed of the victims' organisations around the sentencing power um, I, I think is, ra is rather minimal. Um, I, I don't think the expectation is, 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 is that they should be adjusted to a huge or great degree, uh, and therefore I think the impact would be relatively minimal. But we'll continue to keep it uh, under review. It's certainly an option that we're exploring. I, I, I can't think that there's another option that immediately comes to mind that is, uh, would require legislative change. Certainly, smaller juries or, or, or sentencing powers would. But again, I'll just look to, to Neil for confirmation. Yeah, no, that, that, that's right. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the modelling work that um, the, the court service have prepared, specifically looking at the different options, including the, the uh, amendment to the sentencing powers, um, th that was shared with the committee, and that, that confirms that it would have a marginal difference between um, summary and, uh, and sheriff and jury cases, obviously not for the, the, the more serious cases, but not sufficient to be one that we're pursuing at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Court delays have a significant impact on the victims of, uh, and survivors of crimes, particularly sex crimes and domestic abuse. Over the weekend, the media reported that Rape Crisis Scotland are considering a legal challenge to the government over what they believe could be unlawful delays to sex trials during the coronavirus um, crisis. Um, Cabinet Secretary, I appreciate you might not be able to say too much, but I just wondered what your response to that was. So first and foremost, I've got the utmost respect for, for, for Rape Crisis Scotland. Um, who uh, I understand have sought that legal opinion as as, as you articulate, uh, uh, convener, and and so uh, you know I always take very seriously what Rape Crisis Scotland have to say. They are the absolute foremost experts of when it comes to uh, advocating for the rights uh, of those who have been affected and traumatised uh, by sexual offences and and in particular by rape. Um, I also don't take away for a minute from what they've said about the human impact on survivors. Um, they have spoken to me in a uh, great amount of detail, Rape Crisis have, in, in great amount of detail about the concerns that they have. They, they had obvious disappointment, um, which they expressed and didn't hold back in expressing um, when we decided not to pursue the option of judge-only uh, trials. Um, and I understand the perspective that they, 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 they come from in that. In terms of our own actions, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, as Cabinet Secretary for Justice, I wouldn't bring forward any action that I didn't think was legal uh, and, and was within the legal framework. I'm, I'm, I'm confident of the legal basis uh, for, for any of the action that I take as Cabinet Secretary for Justice. Um, now, if Rape Crisis Scotland, I think they're considering a legal action. I don't think they've actually uh, brought forward a legal action. If they clearly did, then, then we'd engage in the process. But regardless of that, even if I put that to a side, uh, my engagement with Rape Crisis Scotland on this matter uh, will continue to be one of positive engagement, constructive engagement, uh, and listening to what they've got to say, uh, because, as I say, they are the foremost experts and advocates uh, for those who are um, have survived uh, sexual offences and, and, indeed, rape. Thank you. Um, can I bring in Fulton McGregor remotely, please? Thank you, convener. Um, good morning, um, or good afternoon, Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, I'm going to ask uh, some questions on criminal justice social work, and I'll just refer members to my register of interest. Um, and, um, Cabinet Secretary, can you provide uh, details of any discussions that you've had with Social Work Scotland on the specific challenges that have been faced regarding the provision of services during this outbreak, and what um, elements of uh, just identified as priorities? So it's, it's a good question. So uh, yes, I've had dialogue um, with Social Work Scotland. Um, importantly, my my officials in the community justice team speak with Social Work Scotland regularly. I think weekly, actually. Um, and also, uh, Social Work Scotland are a part of our uh, justice board COVID nineteen subgroup um, and, and the recently established community justice and prisons work stream. Uh, that's part of the re recovery renewal. Uh, and transformation programme. So I suppose uh, it's my long way of saying that they're very engaged in the work that we're doing uh, as, as, as a government. 
In terms of the challenges, I think Social Work Scotland uh, wrote to the Justice Committee recently uh, in terms of their, their, their report around the challenges that COVID-19 has brought to the work that they're doing. Uh, I think there's a range of challenges that they, they articulate. Uh, for me, the issue of, of great concern is the outstanding hours of unpaid work uh, that there are at the moment uh, because of, again, uh, the global pandemic, how they've built up the capacity issues then that um, criminal justice social work have uh, across local authorities to deal with that uh, is a matter that is, um, I think, the biggest challenge and the one that I'm certainly giving uh, a great degree of attention to myself. Um, thanks, uh, Cabinet Secretary. I suppose my, my, my next question is actually on uh, that last point that you've made. What, what options do you think are available to um, to, to allow community payback orders and specifically, as you say, unpaid work orders to be completed and, and help reduce this um, th this backlog. Is there any discussions ongoing at this time about how how that may be achieved? There are. I, I've got to explore every option uh, here. It would be foolish of me not to. And, and not only has Social Work Scotland written into the committee and to me, but you'll have seen uh, respond, uh, correspondence from COSLA. Uh, as well on this, and I think Community Justice um, um, Scotland. So th the member will be aware that um, when we brought forward regulations under the Coronavirus Act uh, 2020, it enabled uh, and contained powers to enable us to postpone or, or, or vary uh, community orders in certain circumstances. Um, so I'm looking at whether or not we can vary uh, the community orders in order to reduce the burden that local authorities and criminal justice social work departments are looking at. I think it's only right that I do that. Um, and so I'd like to do that in a way that continues to um, maintain people's confidence in the system, but at the same time, you know, listening to our local authority leaders about the real challenges that those outstanding unpaid work hours are, are causing them. Thanks, Cabinet Secretary. That sounds really um, proactive. Of course, part of um, Orders as well often includes uh, group work se uh, sessions such as for uh, sex offenders or those that have been convicted of domestic abuse. And you'll remember that um, not too long ago asked about the, ro uh, the further rollout of the Caledonia programme in the chamber, and you, you talked in your response about um, uh, some capacity being made for virtual sessions um, of, of this programme. Is there any progress on that? Is there any work being done to? Um, allow for Caledonia and other programmes to be done virtually, or is there any plans in place for, for some of the work to, to go back into in-person group sessions? Uh, and, get, and just to tie a few um, uh, questions together, uh, Cabinet Secretary, if you don't mind, um, what about with those issues um, with internet access uh, in these scenarios as well? Yeah, so the, there are some good and important questions. Um, you know, the, the, there's no doubt that there's been an impact with the suspension of group work, uh, which again was unavoidable due to the public health crisis that we're facing. I suppose my concern, first and foremost, as Justice Secretary, was to ensure that despite the suspension of group work, um, could we ensure that the MAPA arrangements in place for those that have committed sexual offences were, were absolutely robust and stringent, regardless of the public health um, uh, challenges that we face. So I've been very reassured <clears throat> uh, by the fact that MAPA arrangements continue to operate effectively, be they through phone or virtual settings. So, so, so that's given me, a, again, a great degree of confidence. What we're looking to do, um, so in some, um, the Caledonian uh, domestic abuse program uh, has resumed uh, in some areas. Um, the situation is being monitored in local areas um, where group work is still suspended. What we're looking to also do in relation to the Caledonian programme um, is, is detailed guidance has been issued in relation to a one-to-one -one alternative. So I know the group work element is important in these programmes, but Caledonian work, the Caledonian have been working with a variety of stakeholders and partners to look at what the one-to-one -one, uh, dynamic uh, might look like uh, as well. So uh, the work on that is at quite an advanced stage uh, and similar discussions are now being held also um, with uh, the MFMC programme, um, Moving Forward Making Changes programme, which again, he'll be very aware of uh, as well. Um, the issue of digital poverty is uh, a big one. It's one that's been discussed regularly uh, by, by government. Um, in respect to digital inclusion, I know that Connecting Scotland 
um, their projects being delivered by the Scottish Government uh, in partnership with local authorities, Healthcare Improvement Scotland, uh, Scottish Council of Voluntary Organisations and others. Um, the Five Million programme currently in, pla in place that's funding uh, funded through communities will provide 9,000 devices, uh, data and support for digitally excluded people. Um, I think there's probably a piece of work for us to do. We, we, we've looked at that for, for example, families outside in terms of prisons, you know, that cannot, can, can, you know, are struggling to connect with virtual visits um, with, with those that are, are in our prisons. I think it's uh, not an unreasonable ask uh, for us to take that away uh, to make sure that um, my, my, my colleagues who are working on the, the group work are also plugged into that. Uh, and seeing whether or not uh, we can make best use of that uh, resource that's available. But again, uh, maybe look at Neil Rennick to see if there's anything particular that he would add to, to that. No, just to confirm, we'll, we'll provide some uh, some further uh, background on that um, by writing, if, that, if that's helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Please to James Kelly. Yeah, yeah, but, uh, oh, Sorry, you... Fulton, we're really up against time. Sorry. <laughs> can we move on to James All Kelly, right, please? Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Convener, and uh, good afternoon, Cabinet Secretary. I want to turn to the issue of prisons. Um, we heard in the previous session from Theresa Medhurst that prison numbers are on the rise again. They've reduced to 6,900 uh, as a result of the prisoner release scheme, and they're now up to 7,300. And worryingly, Ms Medhurst said that this was resulting in an increase in uh, double occupancy in terms of sales, and that will be a particular in, uh, concern at prisons like Berlin, where uh, there's a significant number of double occupancy taking place in cells that are designed for single occupancy. So, given the, the prison numbers are on the rise again, uh, but we've still got the continued threat of the pandemic, how can you uh, give assurance around the safe and humane uh, running of prisons and that uh, prison safety will still be a priority. Prison of safety will still be a priority. Yeah, it's, it's a really uh, fundamental and important question from from James Kelly. Uh, is the question that takes up a significant amount of my uh, time. Uh, there was always going to be a rise uh, in, in, in the prison population, without a shadow of a doubt, when court business began to resume. Uh, what's worrying me uh, is, is certainly that pace of that increase. Um, and what we can do in order to mitigate it. So we certainly cannot go back to levels where we were pre-pandemic, which was you know above 8,000, I think we were at peak 8,100. Just cannot go back to that situation for uh, very good reasons, very humane reasons, as he rightly says, but also clearly for public health reasons. That would be unacceptable to go up to that level. Um, so we're exploring a, a range of options um, to try to mitigate against that. Um, HTC has gone up during the pandemic, but is not high enough. So I'd like to see the numbers increase in terms of home detention curfew. Um, you know, there's more work that we can do on remand, and I can talk to that um, uh, if, if you'd like it later. But certainly, reducing the remand population is important. I think once we resume sheriff and jury trials as well, we'll again begin to see that number in remand uh, hopefully uh, reduce. Uh, as well. And ultimately, as a last resort, and I'd only ever considered it, as I've said before, as a last resort, there could be another early uh, release scheme, although it's not something I'm actively exploring at the moment. It's always an option under the legislation that does exist. But what I cannot have uh, is a situation where our prison population um, goes back to levels of where it was pre-pandemic, because James Kelly is absolutely right to say that there's concerns around how humane that is with a pandemic. But certainly, the real issues that that would raise um, during a pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, um, Liam MacArthur. Please. Thanks, convener. Um, just following on from that, cabinet secretary, you referred to the the issue in relation to remand. We had that exchange in the chamber last week. Um, I, I take on board what you said there in terms of efforts to, to reduce the remand population, but obviously this is a problem that, that pre-existed the pandemic. So I wonder whether um, you might uh, be considering committing yourself to a, 
a, a, a target reduction in terms of numbers for those in demand, and specifically whether that you have um, uh, any proposals that you're considering in relation to reducing the demand population amongst young prisoners, where the overall numbers are small, but the percentage uh, as a, a, as a uh, percentage of the overall uh, prison population for young people is higher than it is for the adult population. I think that number for young people is always going to be skewed because of the the, the population being as small as it is for young people. Um, so 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 the percentage therefore that's on remand can can, can often be skewed um, for, for that reason. But I don't I don't take away from anything he's saying. Um, for me, I think the electronic monitoring uh, for 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 bail could be a really important. Uh, step a significantly important step actually, uh, in order to reduce uh, the number on remand. Um, again, sheriff and jury will help us to do that uh, as well. Um, but there is not one single solution to this. Uh, in terms of a target, I think again, if we went in the midst still of, of, of a global pandemic, that wouldn't be uh, off the table. I think you know it would be worth exploring whether or not we should not just for remand, but there's a question whether we should as a government. Um, have 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 a target and a cut-off point whereby we say this is the number of prisoners we have in our establishments and no more. Um, but I think there's that that's something we might well you know consider or explore uh, if we went in the midst of a, a global pandemic. Uh, in the midst of a global pandemic, our ability to to do as much as we like to do in this can somewhat be restricted. Um, and, and 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 sometimes different rules apply, uh, as per for example the Coronavirus Act. So. Um, I wouldn't normally necessarily be absolutely opposed uh, to, to, to the suggestion of, 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 of a target, but ultimately the focus has to be on reducing the numbers. Um, you know, creating a, a target won't do that automatically. Uh, surely it'll potentially focus the minds, but I can give you a guarantee that our minds are very focused on uh, reducing the population as a whole, but particularly looking at the remand population. Thank you. Can, can we move on, please? Oh, sorry, big pardon. Uh, brief Small supplementary. supplementary. Yep. Just yep. on that exact point, Cabinet Secretary, uh, about the remand uh, significant numbers. I think I'm right in saying that Section 24 of the Criminal Procedure Act gives the Lord Advocate the ability to look at this area, to look at bail and look at remand. And if that's right, are you aware if the Lord Advocate is looking at whether uh, he needs to be looking at this and uh, perhaps actively instructing uh, local PF staff to review the situation. Yeah, I, I certainly know that it's, uh, and the Lord Advocate can obviously speak for himself, but it's certainly a discussion Lord Advocate and I have had. So I, I need to tread really carefully here because obviously, you know, the decision of a prosecutor of whether or not to oppose bail is one for them to take independently. And of course, the decision of whether to remand somebody or give them bail is one for the, the, the sheriff or indeed the judge in an appropriate trial. So I have to really tread carefully here, but certainly the Lord Advocate and the judiciary have got to be part of the discussion. And whether the Lord Advocate is actively looking at this with his uh, prosecutors or not is something you'd have to ask Lord Advocate, and I couldn't tell you for sure. Uh, but certainly I know it's been in discussions. This issue of bail remand um, uh, has been a discussion that I've had with the Lord Advocate, and certainly the government, Lord Advocate and judiciary have to be part of the solution uh, to, to, to this, because there are some things that are in my gift and so electronic monitoring for bail is effectively, I would hope, acting as a, a reassurance um, to, 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 to the judiciary that if they do uh, put some, give somebody bail and grant them bail, then, then they have a reassurance that the electronic monitoring will prevent things like um, non-appearance at future courts. Um, so uh, that, that's my job, but I have to be honest and say that um, it would really be for a Lord Advocate to give you a detailed answer of whether or not He's having those discussions with prosecutors down the line. Thank you. Thank you. Shona? Yep, uh, thank you. Just uh, to ask briefly, um, Cabinet Secretary, are you content that enough is uh, being done to improve conditions for prisoners following the restrictions imposed at the start of lockdown, and also whether enough is being done to help uh, the families of prisoners during the, the current pandemic? Yes, I'm, I'm really satisfied with the approach that the Scottish Prison Service has, has taken. Uh, look, we'll not, we'll not get everything right all of the time. There'll be family members, maybe that'll be frustrated at the pace uh, sometimes at which uh, we're, we're, we're going at because it's their loved one. So um, I know how difficult it was not seeing my mum for three months, um, but for people who have a loved one, a partner, a parent, uh, you know, an in, 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 
uh, person visit wasn't possible for even long, much long, you know, for four, four and a half odd months. So really, really, really challenging um, uh, set of circumstances. So I don't, I don't take away from family members that maybe were upset um, at the at the pace at which we can move. But I'm absolutely satisfied that the prison service um, have moved forward at a pace that not only they thought. Um, they could move at operationally, but what was safe to do so in terms of public health guidance. Um, and I think they've been innovative. Um, you know, we've been looking at the issue of mobile phones prior to this, um, but you know, we've moved at a pace on the issue of mobile phones, the issue of virtual visits, um, and indeed uh, now, and, and, and now we've managed to get to a position of in-person visits, which I think is really important. So. I think there's always lessons to learn, but I'm satisfied really uh, by the approach uh, SPS have taken. And I think if you looked at the commentary from the independent inspectorate, uh, she has been uh, nothing short of effusive in her praise at the way in which SPS has handled the very difficult circumstances of the pandemic. OK, thank you. Um, are you committed to keeping virtual visits going um, as a concept beyond the pandemic? And also, if you could just... Tell us what support um, the Scottish Government is providing to organisations involved in the through care of prisoners and um, you know, when we're we likely to return to previously supported levels of through care that we saw before the, the pandemic. Yeah, on, on the question of virtual visits, I think we should maintain them. They should be, they should be uh, kept. Um, you know, we, we heard stories of prisoners who weren't really having family uh, didn't have family visits um, prior to, to, to COVID, uh, but were then able to connect with family who maybe live abroad, for example. And we know from all the research um, that, 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 that um, has come forward from criminologists and others that have an expertise in prisons, that family connections are so, so important to rehabilitation. Uh, it's also why, for example, I mean, you know, this will depend on funding, resource, etc. But certainly I think uh, there's a very, very strong argument for retaining mobile phones within prisons. Now they're restricted, um, so you continue to have those security restrictions. Um, but giving prisoners access to be able to phone helplines like the Samaritans and others mm. can have a huge impact on their mental health and the reduction in suicides, we believe. Uh, but also the retention of familial contact, fam you know, retaining contact with a family can pay real dividends when it comes to the potential reduction in in, 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 in reoffending. Similar, similarly, when it comes to, to through care services, can I can I pay tribute to um, likes of, of Sacro and the Wise Group in particular, who've really worked um, closely with the prison service um, to to uh, ensure that they can provide services for those that are leaving prison or about to leave prison, um, but also looking to see what more work they can do within the public health guidance within prisons. Um, so I, I'm really pleased to support them uh, as best I can. I, I know the through care service, uh, through care um, services, they started using uh, email a prisoner system, uh, so to reach out to eligible prisoners. Mm -hmm. uh, while day of release support um, hasn't been po possible, they, they started creating liberation packs um, as well, which provided personalised information, advice, brochures, travel on how, uh, advice about travel, advice about um, how to get to statutory services. The packs also contained vouchers that could be used to purchase a mobile phone from the local supermarket, mm -hmm. kind of basic smartphone, again, to keep in contact with statutory services and so on and so forth. So I've been really impressed with the work the third sector, uh, but particularly SACRO and, and, and the WISE group have done. Um, and I'll continue to keep close engagement with them about what their needs are uh, for the future. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Final question from uh, supplementary from Liam Kerr. Yeah. Just very briefly, because uh, I've been struggling to, to find the figures on this cabinet section. You mentioned the mobile phones. Do you know off the top of your head what the full cost of issuing those mobile phones were in the prisons? Uh, and have you any idea what the on cost uh, of having them in the prisons will be, the SIM card and the contractual basis? Yeah. We certainly have the figures. Forgive me, I need, we need to rifle through my, my, my briefing to try to find it. But um, we, we can certainly provide that information, uh, though it might have to be a bit careful around commercial sensitivities, etc., etc. But generally, it's a broad brush. We should be able to provide you uh, some figures and writing around the cost uh, of that. It's, it's not, uh, you know, uh, th there's an economy of scale because we've managed to purchase uh, thousands of handsets uh, at a time uh, and SIMs. Um, so there's been a, certainly, certainly uh, an economies of scale. The funding issue, uh, you know, 
there have been some cost savings, for example, in, 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 in SPS's budget, as well as, of course, cost pressure. So construction hasn't been able to take place, so therefore a number of capital costs have been able to be reprofiled uh, in, in, in year. Um, so forgive me, I don't have the exact figure uh, to hand. Again, I'll, I'll need to look to Neil Rennick if there's more information he can provide. But ultimately, if the committee would like figures on um, the cost of mobile phones, I'm, I'm happy, uh, whereas appropriate, to provide that. I'll be very grateful. Thank you. Yeah, no, this is a cabinet, so it's it. Cabinet Secretary says we'll double check um, what we're allowed to reveal about that and, and make sure we share that. Very kind. Thank you. Thank you. That completes our questions. Um, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary and his officials for that very helpful update? Thank you. Our next item of business is a short discussion to ratify the decisions we made at last week's uh, business planning meeting. For the record, the committee met informally via MS Teams on Tuesday 11th of August to consider its forward work programme up to the end of the year. I refer members to paper three, which provides a note of those decisions. Do members have any points they want to make or are you content to ratify the decisions we made and ask the clerks to make arrangements with me to issue this information publicly? Are we all agreed? Thank you. Agreed. That brings the public part of our meeting to a close. Our next meeting will be on Tuesday, 25th of August, when we'll recommence Stage 1 oral evidence, taking, oral evidence taking on the Defamation and Malicious Publications Scotland Bill. We'll also consider some secondary legislation next week. I now close the public part of this meeting and we move into private. <laughs>